I'll be quiet and back down. Thanks very much for the introduction and permission to, to film this session, uh, which is part of a, a record of an ongoing debate that many of you, if not all of you, are aware has taken place around these subjects of the minority population um, and migration and violence and Catholic and Protestant relations in the South. In this paper, I argue interpretations of political violence during the post-1969 so-called troubles influenced the historicization of the nationalist independence struggle of the 1920s. The paper references a broader, what I call a counterinsurgency historiography, in which negative values like fascism, sexual violence, cultural vandalism, the burning of the forecourts, for example, and ethnic cleansing have been associated with Irish republicanism in the past, it is argued, as a way of undermining Irish republicanism in the present. Some may argue this approach to writing the past was necessary in recent decades, and certainly I'm open to that position when it is properly articulated, though it seldom is. Nevertheless, the historiography I describe involves historians compromising their empiricism with ahistorical methodologies sometimes demanding the invention of evidence. In the 1980s, narratives defining the conflict in Northern Ireland shifted. The separatist nationalist narrative describing the post-1969 troubles as the latest episode in a centuries-old anti-imperialist struggle ceded ground to ethno-nationalist <coughs> explanations. Some historians said Ulster's new violence resulted from primitivist instincts and the implacable ancient tribal hatreds of Roman Catholics and Protestants, not from British misrule or from partition or other structural issues like institutionalized discrimination or indeed British uh, strategic defense interests. <coughs> Uh, the provisional IRA bombing <coughs> of a remembrance service in Enniskillen in November 1987 is, I think, a decisive moment. What? Do it. What? No, no. No other atrocity emphasised more the perception the IRA's war had degenerated into naked sectarian violence. And this changing perception coincided with the historiographical turn I want to speak about today. Taking their prompt from contemporary conflicts in the Balkans, soon after Enniskillen, isolated Protestant communities along the border accused the IRA of ethnic cleansing. For economic reasons, it was said the IRA targeted Protestant farm and business owners in a bid to drive them out. During the 1990s, some historians loudly endorsed this reductive ethnic conflict explanation of Republican violence, past and present. For example, in 2001, Roy Foster wrote the provisional IRA had become enmeshed in implacable tribal hatreds and a policy of ethnic cleansing. Now, coinciding with the emergence of an ethno-nationalist interpretation, other historians began reporting evidence of an ethnic conflict in the 1920s. Now, few disputed an ethno-religious dimension to violence in Ulster during the earlier independence struggle. What was new in the 1990s was the identification of hitherto unseen levels of ethnic violence outside of Ulster. Between 1921 and 1924, historian Peter Harp reported high levels of ethnic violence directed at Protestants in the three southern provinces, and most notably in County Cork, <coughs> the subject of Harp's landmark monograph, The IRA and Its Enemies, published in 1998. 
In the intercensus period between 1911 and 1926, as is well known, the Protestant population in Ireland's southern and western 26 counties declined by just over 100,000, or fully one third of the 1911 southern Protestant cohort. Hart attributed, and I quote, nearly all of this decline to violence directed at southern Protestants by Roman Catholics and by primarily by Roman Catholics in the IRA. In 1996, Hart published a seminal essay claiming campaigns of what might be termed ethnic cleansing were waged in nine southern counties. Hitherto, these explanations went unremembered. And the reason for this amnesia, it was said, was that memories of ethnic violence were negated in a nationalist historiography and subsequently suppressed in the public memory. Now, just to provide context of this, around the same time in the 1990s, the new historians in Israel-Palestine, notably Benny Morris and Ilan Papp, were recovering from official archives the memory of the forgotten Arab expulsions of 1947. I'll mention those again later. Of 1922, in Ireland, Hart memorably concluded, Munster, Leinster, Connacht can take their places with fellow imperial provinces in Silesia, Galicia, and Bosnia as part of the post-war unmixing of peoples in Europe. Provocative, brilliantly written, statistically underpinned, and above all peer-reviewed, Hart's research appeared to some a revelation, providing the provisional as alleged ethnic cleansing in the 1990s with another historical precedent, supposedly Hart's work helped to rationalize contemporary events in Northern Ireland. And certainly um, Hart's research was picked up on by, by, uh, in, in Northern Ireland by uh, the loyalist community represented in organs like um, the Orange Orders uh, papers and so forth. Impervious to the apparent methodological problems, liberal academics defended Hart's research as groundbreaking, and, and some still do. Outside the academy, Hart's work provoked controversy, and some dismissed it as an ahistorical assault on Irish republicanism. And meanwhile, Hart's career advanced, first to an appointment as a lecturer at Queen's University in Belfast, then in 2002 to a chair at Memorial University in his native Newfoundland. Tragically, in 2010, at the age of 46, Peter Hart died. Hart's analysis of Southern Protestant decline rests on three data sets scattered amongst archives in Belfast, Dublin, Cork, and, and, and rural West Cork, which I've recently visited. Between 1911 and 1926, Hart's data sets identified a 30% decrease in the enrollment of Episcopal school children in the combined diocese of Cork. Now, obviously, this pattern accurately mirrored wider trends in Protestant depopulation. Alarmingly, however, Hart claimed nearly three quarters of the decline in the school enrollments between 1911 and 1926, three quarters, happened in 1920 and 1922, between 1920 and 1922. Coinciding with the onset of IRA violence, Hart's innovation was to identify a sudden, massive decline in school enrollments. Hart's other data sets, Episcopalian church attendances in West Cork and, and membership of the Methodist Church across the whole of Southern Ireland, supposedly confirm this pattern of sudden decline. These calculations form the statistical premise of the ethnic conflict thesis Hart developed, at the centre of which was the forced exodus of tens of thousands of Southern Protestants. Yet, as Anne alluded to at the beginning, recent scholarship by Barry Keane, Andy Bielenberg, and David Fitzpatrick, among others, has demonstrated Hart's mass exodus to be bogus. And this raises an important question, because Hart's influence on the historiography and within the academy can still, they still be read in, in contemporary and recent monographs. How did Hart account 
for the sudden massive decline in the early 1920s. Now, as I say, I've revisited the, the archives and I've recalculated the um, numbers where possible which Hart drew upon. In the case of school enrolments, Hart employed a false interpolation, <coughs> attribu attributing decline in enrolments between 1920 and 1925, for which no figures exist, because they weren't collected during that trouble period, to just two years, 1920 to 22. So he takes the entire period between 20 and 25 and attributes the decline to just two years. This allows him to say that there is a, a massive and sudden exodus of, exodus, a, a decline, I should say, in school enrollments. If you follow the trajectory, you'll notice a hike in 1918. That isn't a sudden burst of, of new Protestant school children. That's simply uh, a, a change in the way that they're calculating the enrollments. They, they introduce model schools and other schools that haven't been counted previously. But the decline from 1911 and again through 1919 to 1921 is rather steady and rather even. Now we don't know what happened between 20 and 25, um, but it is incorrect to attribute all of that loss, it seems to me, to just two years. In his exposition, of Protestant decline in and around 1922, Hart then changed his statistical base without informing the reader, and, and this is critical. He describes decline in school enrollments in 1920 and 22 as a percentage, as a percentage of the total decline between 1911 and 1926. But Hart then calculates the decline in church attendances and Methodist membership as a percentage of the total decline only between 1919 and 1926. Now, shortening the survey period inflates the percentage of missing or absenting Protestants in 1920 and 1922 or thereabouts, because the shorter period exaggerates the influence of the British military withdrawal in 1922. <coughs> and this, this can be demonstrated. Now, Hart doesn't tell us exactly which churches he examined, but he does identify the church unions which he drew information from. And by surveying the records in the church unions, we're able to, in this graph here, um, pretty accurately reproduce Hart's results. So he, he says 1922 accounts for two thirds of the total decline um, in church attendances. I've gone over the books in the church preachers' books in Dublin and Cork, West Cork, um, and I've come up with pretty much the same kind of statistics, 63% of the decline for that period. But um, doing that, I've excluded Abistruri uh, Church uh, because of the high number of military that were, were, were present in Skibbereen at the time. And Hart says that he that Crown forces play no part in his figures, uh, in his exposition. Now, that's not entirely possible, because 
he's not, it's not clear that you can ex, uh, extract school children whose parents were military or indeed police uh, from the numbers. But it is possible by um, removing Aberst Druid to still come up with more or less a percentage that relates to what Hart was arguing. If we move over to the second graph, um, I've, in the second graph, I have removed St. Coleman's in McCroom um, because it had a high number of auxiliary officers uh, stationed there, and they were clearly, and this is noted in the, in the preacher's books, attending church. If we remove McCroom from the equation, it should be remembered the auxiliaries were not crown <coughs> forces. The auxiliaries did not hold the commission of the king. If we remove the auxiliaries from St. Coleman's, or St. Coleman's from the parish, uh, and recalculate, um, 1922 accounts for just 6% of the decline in 1911 to 1926. And that's a long way from 63%, or 66%. It's a long way from that. So my point is very simple. But the way that Hart is constructing the numbers <coughs> is by using a, a faulty statistical method uh, which exaggerates the uh, influence of the British withdrawal in 1922. The most detailed and accurate um, statistical analysis we have of the Protestant community in Ireland is the Methodist census. Uh, and of this part, says Methodist membership was higher in 1918 and 1919 than 1920 than, and 1920 than in 1914, but fell precipitously thereafter. Once again, 1921-23 were the critical years, accounting for 74% of the lost population. 74%. Now, some of you will be familiar from David Fitzpatrick's research of this graph, which. Um, chart the decline of southern Methodists in the southern provinces. Um, and as you can see, it's a steady decline. Mm -hmm. There is evidence in all of these day sets of some acceleration around 1922, as we would expect. That diminishes the more we remove British forces from the figures. Um, but we're looking roughly at 6 7% uh, decline year on year over this period. And the decline, and this is the critical point, is the decline is steady, not sudden. If we just return to the quotation again for a second, you will see that it bears very little relationship to it's a steady decline, and there isn't the jumping around. Now, I can't account for this in, in Hart's interpretation, other than to suggest, and this actually works, that he double counted the juvenile sections of the Methodist community. And that produces a result which tallies with this. But that's a very, very significant misinterpretation of the numbers. What is remarkable is that all of the three data sets which are miscalculated and misinterpreted all agree with the thesis that there is a sudden decline in the early 1920s. The statistics of that being a chance are, I think, um, astronomical. Now, it might be said that explanation of Hart's research methodology are of little value given the Exodus myth has recently been debunked, though I suspect some people in this room will take issue with that proposition, <laughs> and I, I welcome that, truly. Now, that may be. And yet, I want to advance two reasons why we should study Hart's methodology um, very closely. Firstly, what Hart's applied in 1996, and this is the key point of this, this, this contribution, was a false statistical premise for his ethnic conflict thesis. Now, once accepted, once the false statistical premise has burned its way into your memory, it establishes a paradigm, a new paradigm, into which anecdotal evidence of ethnic violence was neatly fitted. So we have the headline statistic, massive sudden exodus, then we can go to the archive, and we will identify incidents of sectarian violence. 
but they do not back up the false statistical premise because the false statistical premise is invented history. It is not based on any true rendering of the available facts and evidence that's available. Some rejected Hart's use of the term ethnic cleansing, including eventually Hart himself. Nevertheless, for 20 years, no one identified the false statistical premise on which Hart's claims rested. And this, I think, has to be significant. A bogus and very doubtful statistical methodology was produced, and it was to make a significant contribution to the way that we perceive this period and intercommunal relations until very recently. Um, and various numbers, tens of thousands of people being forced to migrate um, has found its way into the literature. And there's no doubt that people were forced to migrate in, in the revolutionary period. But it's certainly not on the scale of 60, 70,000, which Hart's research indicated, or other reports in newspapers of slightly lesser numbers in recent years, which perhaps we could discuss in the Q&A. Now, here again, I draw attention to the power of um, statistical premise as prefiguring the reception of anecdotal information. An example of a false statistical premise leading to a catastrophic misinterpretation of anecdotal evidence is provided by Michael Bell Sile's book, Arming America, the Origins of a National Gun Culture, published in 2000. In a journal article, also published like Hart in 1996, Bell Siles advanced statistical evidence purporting to prove very, very low gun ownership in pre-Civil War America. The inalienable right to bear arms, by Bell Siles claimed, rested on a myth of widespread gun ownership in the early American Republic. Addressing the controversy surrounding gun control in the US, like Hart, Bell Siles' research was under, unavoidably politicized. While the Liberal <coughs> Academy embraced Bell Siles, the National Rifle Association denounced his, finding, uh, his findings as ludicrous. Now, Bell Siles developed his prize-winning article into a prize-winning winning book. On behalf of the trustees of Columbia University in the city of New York to present the Bancroft Prize to Arming America the Origins of a National Gun Culture, published by Alfred A. Knopf. In terms of current scholarly debates, I admit that Arming America is an essentially conservative book based on empirical evidence shying away from the more creative discussions of gender, class, race, and discourse, only because I'm not clever enough to um, develop such an argument. It is based on 10 years of archival research into military, legal, political, personal, literary, and business records. It ends in 1877 and has absolutely nothing to say about current poli policy debates. And yet, many people judge it in terms only of current political debates. Further, I admit sympathy for the complaint that American historians tend to focus on the negative aspects of our history, depicting the early settlers of this nation as genocidal murderers, wiping out Indians, blacks, and other disadvantaged groups. Arming America challenges that perspective by arguing that 17th and 18th century Americans were not as heavily armed and certainly not as violent as they're generally portrayed. Rather, they were farmers and workers intent on the needs of their families, for whom a gun was an expensive and largely unnecessary luxury associated with the military and the upper class. They were thus rational actors. I have no idea why, but it seems that some people prefer their ancestors as irrational, heavily armed, genocidal murderers, and find, in my contradiction of this image, a dangerous challenge to their current way of life. But despite being supported by voluminous 240 pages of footnotes, anecdotal evidence, the statistical premise on which his research rested was utterly false. Gun ownership was higher than Bell Siles calculated, and much of his interpretation rested on statistical nonsense. Bell Siles' resignation from his chair at Amory University in 2002 provides a second salutary warning about the danger of statistical premises in the reception of <coughs> historical information. 
Like Hart, Belsiles told the Liberal Academy something it wanted to hear. And like Hart, Belsiles indulged rhetorical history, where Hart told a story about the past, the real attraction of which were prejudices held in the present. Des dazzled by pseudo-empiricism for long and short, the, the Academy endorsed research resting on miscalculated or quite possibly invented statistics. In 1996, Hart said nearly all of the exodus of 100,000 Southern Protestants between 1911 and 1926 occurred in the revolutionary years 1921 to 24. Yet Hart's 1998 book neither references ethnic cleansing, some of you have noticed, mm -hmm. nor the statistical analysis underpinning his 1996 essay. Now, the resequence of this research is important. In 1992, having submitted his doctorate, Hart won a 55,000 Canadian dollar Arts and Humanities postdoctoral award to research Protestants in Revolutionary Cork. Having developed his ethnic conflict thesis in his doctoral dissertation, Hart gathers statistics on Protestant demography. But because no mass exodus occurred in 1922, or thereabouts, the statistics he consulted had to contradict his ethnic conflict thesis. Eth invented histories leave no archive. Protestant decline, as nearly all, as some now agree, there are possible exceptions, was little influenced by revolutionary violence. Certainly, that's Fitzpatrick's conclusion, <coughs> Key, Key, uh, Barry Keane's conclusion, and to a lesser extent, Bielenberg's conclusion. Hart's solution to the problem of no evidence was to calculate somehow, I don't quite understand, his data sets producing results endorsing an evidence selection bias in his PhD thesis. Hart formulated a false statistical premise. But unlike Bell Siles, Hart's false premise was not really a premise at all. It was an afterthought. It was a post hoc rationalization. The statistics were constructed to endorse the thesis. Hart's ethnic conflict thesis is still loudly endorsed by some historians and political scientists. And certainly, I think Hart's research for a generation was held up as a, as a model of what history could be in terms of reaching an audience, delivering a narrative, saying something important, speaking to the public, but it was not historical. And that fact alone divided the historical community as it still does. I come across younger scholars writing their first monograph and I see the trace of Hart's methodology in their use of sources. And so I think it's an ongoing problem rather than something that we have left to the past. For example, a monograph published in 2014 by Cambridge University Press found evidence of intimidation and persecution against targeted monster Protestants between 19 and 23, similar to that used to expel three quarters of a million Arabs in Israel-Palestine between 1947 and 1950. This was the premier controversial conclusion of the said monograph. But if there was no Protestant exodus, how accurate can this comparison possibly be? Mm. Citing Hart's revised 1996 essay, Paul Bew recently wrote that in the sectarian tumult of 1922, Protestants in Cork were even more vulnerable than Catholics in Belfast. What we know of Belfast between 1920 and 22 is that thousands of the minority population experience workplace expulsions and home evictions while, I, while over 200 were killed. Once we remove Hart's exodus myth <coughs> from our memory, and listening to the papers earlier on in the morning, I think that's work in progress, <laughs> comparisons between targeted ethnic groups in Palestine and Munster, no more than Belfast and Cork, appear distorting. Such comparisons do, however, score political points where, historically, they associate republicanism with ethnic violence. 
and there seems to be an appetite, if not encouragement for that, in some quarters of the academy. It took two years and two formal inquiries by senior historians for scholars in the United States to debunk Bell Siles' false statistical premise. Among Irish scholars, it has taken closer to 20 years to resolve Hart's error. These observations speak to the quality of the empiricism sometimes employed when telling the right story at the right time. Thank you very much for your attention.